Coming up on Ann Arbor tonight at home, we have a great show for you. We have the one, the only Greg Harden on the show. We have comic Timmy Boyle, and we have the wonderful music talent of Canon Elizabeth. Great show coming up. Yeah, football is underway in Ann Arbor, and the University of Michigan is charging people $70 to have a picture of their face in the crowd during games. Well, I don't know about you, but that's what I call face value. <laughs> yeah, we're all doing our best to get through the pandemic still. And of course, things are definitely still crazy out there. All of us are still doing our best to adjust to the new normal. Yeah, recently here in Ann Arbor, a local hospital, they nicknamed a nurse <laughs> Appendix. Well, and that's because all the doctors wanted to take her out. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I would like to take a moment to thank all of our hometown heroes that are our essential nurses, doctors, and physicians. Uh, thank you, all of you, for the sacrifice that you've put in and continue to put in to fight this battle against COVID-19. Uh, I appreciate it, we all do, and you really are our hometown heroes, so thank you. Recently, I had a friend and he applied for a job at a large food chain. Well, and when they asked him for experience, he said, I eat every day. <laughs> I was uh, running some jokes by my sister the other day, and I told her a joke, and you know what she said, guys? Neat. <laughs> That's right. She said, neat to a joke. And of course, just to make sense, I said, no, on the rocks and make it a double. <laughs> we have a great show coming up at Ann Arbor tonight at home, so please stay tuned. Hello everyone and welcome back to Ann Arbor Tonight at Home. I am so excited to introduce our feature interview guest for this episode. He is a life coach and executive coach and motivational speaker. He was the associate athletic director and the director of athletic counseling at the University of Michigan Athletic Department, the one and only Greg Harden. Welcome, Greg Harden. Well, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you, Zach. I've uh, watched your show. I'm excited about what you've done and what you've created in terms of uh, being that one guy that understands <laughs> Ann Arbor tonight. <laughs> As you know, it's all about the team, the team, the team, because without my team and without all of us, we could not do this. So yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to uh, jump in, if I may. First of all, you were an outstanding uh, all-city and all-state uh, track and field athlete yourself back at Southwestern High School <laughs> in Detroit. And so I was very curious, Greg Harden, who was your athletic idol growing up? Uh, well, at that stage in life, it was people like Jesse Owens. I mean, I thought Jesse Owens was the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And to, to see the impact that he had on the world of sports and on the world of seeing African-American males as, as uh, superior athletes and taking on uh, the <clears throat> Nazi regime, uh, I mean, it was crazy. So you, you had to see uh, people like that. I mean, I, I had a chance to be that guy that could see uh, uh, Jackie Robinson and everybody else. Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron was the man. One ball and no strikes. Aaron waiting. The outfield deep and straight away. Fastball is a high drive in the deep left center field. Buckner goes back to the fence. It is gone. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, sir. That's awesome. That's awesome. Jesse Owens, Hank Aaron. I mean, great examples for our time, but also in the athletic field as well. And, and you know, interestingly enough, too, you know, you were recruited uh, to the University of Michigan back in 1967. But personal journey for you, very interesting. You had to sort of leave school 
to, to raise a family. And then you had all kinds of different jobs. Um, before you got into counseling, I mean, you were actually a TV cameraman at one point, which I find really awesome, considering we're, we're in the medium. And so I wanted to know, how did your journey from, you know, doing the television camera jobs, and sort of how did that help you uh, kind of continue your journey in education? Uh, let me start by talking about uh, being a TV cameraman, because uh, I assumed Zach, it's hard, I know it'd be hard to believe, but I plan on being in radio, television, and film. Oh my. I had a clear vision that I was going to be Denzel before Denzel. I was <laughs> going to be Spike and the opportunity to tell stories and to create images and to uh, try to shape the way people saw their world was something I wanted to do. And I, I just was clear about it. Uh, University of Michigan had a television studio that was equal to and better than some of the local uh, TV studios in Detroit. It was an unbelievable uh, environment. You would have loved it. Uh, it had everything you could possibly want uh, in terms of a television studio, radio studio. And I was, uh, <laughs> I was the staging and lighting, but the first gig I ever had. Uh, and then I got behind the camera because I felt to be in that industry being talent was, talent was a dime a dozen. And anyone could be uh, set up to be talent, but they could lose their job in 30 seconds. <laughs> so I thought being in front of the camera and in back of the camera was the most important way to create a, a legacy, a, a, a career. Because you wanted to be able to not only be uh, entertainment and talent, but you wanted to create the show and create the footage and the film and and, and be able to tell that story. So I loved it. And there was no way that I thought I'd be in athletics at that day in time. Certainly didn't think I'd be in social work or counseling and be a clinical therapist. Um, and so the beauty of, uh, of that mission though, is when I became invested in, 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 in being a community organizer being a specialist in group theory and process. I also wanted to be a person who did uh, lectures and, and workshops and seminars. Uh, and so what I discovered at an early age is whether someone's eight or 80, they didn't want to be bored. So I put on a show. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's, and it's interesting too, because you talk, you make a really great point, Greg Harden, about being the person behind the camera, and, and but knowing all the parts of how the story is told. And I think, I think in a way, you know, a counselor does the same thing. They've lived life, so they know the different situations that they're being presented uh, by the person that they're working with. And so a little bit of similarities there, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's when you look carefully at, at, at what it really means to be successful, we understand that it's all about relationships, but it's also about marketing and sales. Uh, we like you, Zach. We watch your show because we like you. We like the way you present yourself. We like your story. We like the way that you try to embrace and make everyone feel better about themselves. And so when you're talking about counseling, you have to convince somebody that what you're sharing with them is something you truly believe. Mm. And so what you're trying, and the most interesting thing about counseling, uh, for lack of better words, debating someone or getting, uh, trying to coach someone to be a better version of themselves, you've got to convince them. You've got to convince them to buy one thing, and that's themselves. Mm. I'm trying to sell you, you Zach. I'm trying to get you to believe in one thing. <laughs> you. I'm trying to make you the world's greatest expert on one subject you. <laughs> That's right. But it's still sales. It's still sharing ideas, it's still mm -hmm. sharing philosophies and themes and ways of seeing the world. And sometimes it's helping someone who has a clue find the words to talk about. Awesome. And, you know, and I think that you do a great job of that. Uh, I can tell even now uh, that you are a tremendous listener and that you care about the people that you're interacting with. So thank you for the work that you've done 
uh, in that field to become an expert. But thank you for the work that you're going to continue to do in terms of impacting lives and continuing to do uh, the things that you're doing because well, it means a so lot. Thank you so much, Zach. I appreciate you saying that. But I am so impressed with what you've done in creating a show and, 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 and being a guy that understood the medium of of, of, of local community television and, and trying to create a, a, a format where you could produce and pretty much produce direct <laughs> and star <laughs> in, a, in a show that is about telling other people's story. Thank you. That really means a lot. So I wanted to know too, and you talked a little bit about it in your last response in terms of the facilities at the University of Michigan the studio at the University of Michigan being second to none. But really, what was it? I mean, being from Detroit, what was it that said, the University of Michigan is for me? The bottom line was that I, I wanted to go to school. And um, Ann Arbor was like Shangri-La. <laughs> if you're in Detroit, you know, it was like, right. it's like Mecca. You know? yeah. So to get to Ann Arbor was quite a treat. I uh, was totally unprepared for it uh, and was preoccupied at a time in our American history that reminds you of today. And uh, being a brother from Detroit, went to Ann Arbor and, 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 and not really being prepared to understand what it, the culture shock mm. of going from uh, uh, Detroit and to this environment was quite interesting. But I also uh, I had to depart because you know, I wanted to start a family, and uh, and uh, I thought that that was more important than any time. But how I ended up back in Ann Arbor was it dawned on me at one point that I had never flunked out of school, and that if I wanted to go back to school, I could go back to school. And so, right, without a scholarship, I put myself through undergrad uh, and came back and I uh, had an amazing adventure because what happens is first you when you get on a, in a spot like Ann Arbor, Michigan, and you're at it's awkward and difficult uh, sure. transition. You when you go home, you realize that you've been changed because I never understood the, the the slogan you can never go home again. But that mm. means that once you've seen a, another world and that the world is larger than mm -hmm. the world you grew up in. You start. You have a thirst, and yeah. you have a hunger to find yeah. out what else is out there. Yeah. And so, returning to Ann Arbor and conquering, uh, feeling like you've conquered it by uh, graduating with honors, uh, and then being uh, mentored by the best, Dr. Brabson, and then being convinced uh, to go into counseling. There's no way I thought I'd ever go into counseling. I certainly didn't think I'd be working in athletics, but uh, Ann Arbor, you don't you don't plan to fall in love with a university. I didn't plan on <laughs> loving a university. Sure. That's not what I do. Sure, but you but it gets into your blood, mm. and so Ann Arbor is an unbelievable uh, uh, vista. And but the University of Michigan, it, it, it it's not just legendary. It has an impact on so many lives. And I Absolutely. just wanted to be a part of that. And it kept growing and growing and growing. And every time I get ready to leave, it gets sweet. <laughs> Absolutely. And and again, what an, what an incredible journey. And sort of segueing into that from you getting your degree uh, and having the determination to not only get your degree, but go back and uh, get a master's, just un unbelievable. <laughs> Greg Harden. So I wanted to talk about this too, because with the work that you had done early on in your career in counseling, uh, 1986, you got brought uh, back to the university to do counseling uh, by the legendary coach, Bo Schembechler. I don't ever want to go into a game where I think that the other coach is outworked me. You're fighting the clock and you're, and you're coaching with enthusiasm because if you want your players to play with enthusiasm, you should coach that way. There's no guesswork on the practice schedule. We go right down it, and every single thing that we want prepared for that week has to be done in that practice schedule. I believe very strongly that you play the way you practice. 
Well, get the ball out, Simba! Honest to God, you just run in the tomb there! Liz Blue, 38. Tiger, Mackenzie! Tiger! So many people talk about discipline. That people, the youngsters today, are afraid of discipline. Come football on, players. Come on, man! Come on, man! Oh, All right, that's the stuff. All right. Uh, Kevin, where are you? Keep the ball down and drill it in there. You got to drill it in there. Because he had seen the impact that you had uh, given in your community and was drawn uh, to that. And so can you talk about working with him and, and meeting him for the first time and what that was like? And that's a, that's a great question. Um, the uh, legendary coach uh, uh, decided once I told uh, the guy who called me about coming to speak to the football team that I didn't think it was a good idea because they wanted someone to come talk about alcohol and drugs to 18 to 22 year olds. And um, I argued that 18, 22 year olds know more about it than we do. And if all you want is a rah, rah speech, 20, 45 minutes of we love you, just say no, it's ineffective. So mm -hmm. <laughs> he went back and told Schoenbecker that I rejected the invitation. And wow. so Schoenbecker says, I want to meet this SOB. Because <laughs> <laughs> nobody says no to Bo. <laughs> so uh, that's really how it all started. And we set up a meeting. And there were uh, there was a cast of characters there, um, the team physician, the athletic uh, uh, trainer, the sport administrator, uh, associate ads, and they were all there. And uh, I had 21 questions because it, it, I, if you wanted to do a prevention program, mm -hmm. I needed to know what would actually happen if I gave a lecture. What would happen to a kid if if for some odd reason they were motivated. Mm -hmm. So I told them I was coming, I had a, a, a ton of questions and uh, I was gonna have them convince me to to do something with them. Mm -hmm. I got there and um, the guy introduced me and says, Bo, he's gonna tell you about his program. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I gave him a program. There we go. We <laughs> bought it and he said, and, and he was interested in it. And the best part of the story is he allowed me to have more than a 45 minute session mm. to talk about something other than just alcohol and drugs, but to talk about community, to talk sure. about the importance of, 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 of being there for one another, mm. to focus on the 80% who were not a problem instead of the 20% who might be have problems. Right. And to begin to empower the young people to take control of their own environment because right. I don't care what policies you have. I don't care who the coach is. The peer group is going to decide what we're going to do this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so he coached me. He trained me. Everything I knew about football was from Bo Schimbecker. Oh, for real. <laughs> <laughs> and, not, uh, not a bad coach to have, huh? No, he prepared me in ways that have, uh, was, have lasted for decades. Uh, and the best part of the story was I said, uh, Coach, uh, if you really want me to bond and, and connect and have real honest discussion with your team, coaches can't be there. Mm. And I say, but I need you to introduce me. Yeah. I need you to tell them who I am. Right. And then because I'm not a former football player, I'm not a former NFL player, mm -hmm. I need you to let me kick you out of the room. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, I said, because I need, and I said, the reason that it will work, I said, I need you to say, this is my guy, boom, 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 and I need you to let ceremoniously let yep. me kick you out of the room. Yeah. And, 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 and he says, well, what is the value of that? I said, I have instant credibility. And he set it up. He set me up to be successful. Mm. He set it up so that those players would – they wanted to know who the hell is this guy <laughs> that has the nerve, the audacity. That's to right. Come back I'll talk to you later. Thank you. <laughs> That's how it started. I it was some great cat. I have relationship from mm. the first meeting. Right. Uh, Tim Williams, uh, uh, Ward Manuel was in the first meeting. <laughs> Jim yeah. Harbaugh. 
was in the first meeting. You understand wow. where I'm going? Oh, that I do. I do. I've got friends and colleagues and, and, and partners and, and, and co-workers yeah. from that era. And it, it, it was crazy. Unbelievable. It was, a, it was a great beginning. But that, Shem is, Beckler, that was my guy. That's awesome. The beauty of the work that I have I've had a chance to do is yeah. I get to see Michael Phelps as a regular schmo. Okay. I mean, Michael Phelps comes on campus. I hire uh, his uh, uh, coach to be the men's uh, swim coach. Uh, that team is underneath me. So okay. he brings this guy named Michael Phelps uh, yeah. as a volunteer assistant. Okay. Yeah. So Phelps is on campus, and he had uh, it was a great adventure for him because mm. here we don't care that you, Michael Phelps, you're just <laughs> another star. We yeah. got a million of them. Come on, have a seat. How yeah. you doing? What, where you from? Tell me about yourself. He's like, I heard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, ah, so you know, let me and hey, would you like to meet some other ones? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, Tom Brady's in town. He said he said hello. <laughs> there you so, go. But, but the beauty of, of, of it is to be able to see everyone as a real person. People say, well, did you know Tom Brady was going to be? Hit? No. <laughs> I just knew he was the nicest kid I had met in years. Yeah. And that he was warm and he was open and he was honest and yeah. he was hungry and he was humble and he mm -hmm. was coachable. Chase stays in the block, but he's got the tight end. Brady, corner blitz, middles open, reaches for the touchdown, Michigan, and Brady's legs save the day. Shotgun, Walker again, Clements, got it. Michigan leads it. On the 10 yard pass from the comeback kid. You've worked with some of the biggest names and coaches in history. Michael Phelps, the great Olympian, Tom Brady, Super Bowl champion, great quarterback, you know, Bo Schembechler, the list goes on. But when you counsel an athlete, is there a specific quality that you, that you look for? Well, uh, and remember, it's not always counseling. For example, I'm not counseling Tom Brady. I'm coaching Tom Brady. Because there, there, there are three levels of fitness, Zach. Physical fitness, most of us understand and have a concept of. Mental fitness, we're starting to capture. Spiritual fitness is a whole nother ballgame. Mm -hmm. But mental fitness, mental uh, 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 training has to be part of being the best. What separates the champion, the best, from the regular, from the average, is this. Yeah. You know, uh, for example, Tom Brady is not faster than anybody you've ever met. Is not stronger than anyone you've ever known. <laughs> can't jump higher, okay? You can't lift more weights. Sure. But you can't measure his mind and his heart. So one of the things I'm always looking for is hunger. If you want to know what they have in common, let me tell you that. Sure. Let me tell you what Desmond Howard and Tom Brady and, and Michael Phelps and, and Jawan Howard all have in common, what Charles Woodson has in common, hunger. There's a hunger and a passion and a fire in their bones to, to, to just be the best. Yeah. But there's humility. Humility is what's required in order to be coachable. Mm. Everybody hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody say they want it. But how many can be trained to go to the next level, right. to take it to the next step? And so uh, what I'm always looking for is whether or not someone can surrender their ego mm -hmm. long enough to let somebody else give them a clue. To give, like you said earlier, you, I, we don't know everything. And so once you can surrender to the fact that the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Right. Mm. And so uh, I'm always looking for that coachability factor. Who sure. wants to be trained? Who is willing to open up their mind? Mm. Who is willing to reevaluate and reframe the way they're thinking? Right. We, we all come in with bad habits and bad ways of, of seeing the world or how, we, how hard we are on ourselves or criticizing ourselves, or having self-defeating attitudes and behaviors. Mm. How can you teach people to, to be committed to self-honesty and then be willing to 
look at what's working and what's not working and discover for themselves what they need to work on. Once mm -hmm. you become the world's greatest expert on you, you're also going to know your strengths and your weaknesses and come up with a plan to correct or eliminate. Let, let's end with this piece. Let's be real clear that the people who are doing well are those people who understand that their self-worth and self-esteem is not based on what they do. It's not based on performance. It's not based on their cash flow. It's not based on uh, uh, always being seen. So what we're discovering is that the people who are now willing to look, now everyone's forced to listen to what's in their mind. Everyone's being forced to think about who am I? And where am I going? Life and death now is not just a, 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 a distant thought. It's a reality, a current contemporary thought that I have to process at all times. And so what's important is that people continue to set up routines and have formulas where they know that their day, what they're going to be doing that day, what they're going to be doing in the afternoon and in the evening. They may not be able to do all that they used to do, but right. they can still do something. But they also have to get out of their comfort zone and begin to care about others even more than they have before. Right. And that's the reason you wear a mask. I wear a mask to protect you. You wear a mask to protect me. It's not about me. Right. You understand? Right. So uh, the, the, the challenge uh, that people are facing right now, especially as we start talking about sports, uh, everything is about to change. And like I said earlier, change is inevitable. Yeah. That which cannot be avoided or evaded. Yeah. You better embrace change and you better be prepared to flow and, and be flexible and figure out make it, how to make your next move your best move. Right. Because this will end. This will change. And how will it change you? Be deliberate about how you're going to change during a pandemic. Be deliberate about how you're going to change during the social unrest that is real for people right now. And understand that you've got to prepare yourself. There are some athletes right now that are preparing to be the best. There's some athletes right now just sitting around moaning and groaning and, and complaining about what they don't have and what they can't do. The kid that's sitting up talking about, hey, if I get to play tomorrow or we don't get to play for another year, I'm going to be ready. Yep. There's an executive that's saying if the company uh, uh, fluctuates for a while, you know, uh, if it doesn't turn around tomorrow, it's going to turn around, and I'm yep. going to be ready. Yep. Be ready because change is coming, and change is not always going to be negative and bad. And what can we get out of this moment? It's what you have to focus on. Absolutely. Greg Harden, thank you so much. Ann Arbor tonight at home. Really appreciate everything that you do. I know we're definitely behind you. So thank you so much. And I hope one day uh, we can have you in the studio. You will have me. That's Talk right. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Folks, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ann Arbor tonight. to Ann Arbor tonight at home. I am Zach Damon. I am so excited to welcome our comic guest for the episode. He is Canada's clean comedy man, Mr. Timmy Boyle. Welcome, Timmy. Zach, how are you doing, man? Great, man. Doing great. You're looking good. 
My goodness, uh, vastly different than you and I being in the studio and being on the couch, but we're making do. Absolutely, man. We got to do whatever we can. I actually, when this COVID hit, uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. I'm technically challenged, but uh, I ended up starting an Instagram live show. And uh, this, this here might be the most technical thing I've ever done. So I'm very excited about it. <laughs> well, and awesome. And by the way, you do a great job uh, at your Instagram uh, comedy show. I've had a chance to check it out. Super funny. Uh, how can people uh, see it on Instagram? What's your handle? Uh, I'm at the real Timmy Boyle on uh, on Instagram, but the uh, the show is now stopped. We did a hundred episodes called "Calling Comedians in Quarantine," and we called 65 comics uh, over 150 days from all around the world. Um, some of those episodes are available on the IGTV short, like for the next little while. But then they're all going to be launched in podcast form and on YouTube at Timmy's Shorts. So if you want to check those out, uh, just a great conversation of. Uh, talking about comedy life in the background and see what people are doing in their homes during this time. Oh, I love it, man. Great stuff and a great comedy scene in Canada. So I wanted to ask you too, I mean, <clears throat> as a comic, I mean, what have you been doing this quarantine? I mean, you know, you've been doing the Instagram show, uh, yeah. you know, you've been doing that, uh, but you know, have you been writing more? Uh, I mean, you know, what, do you, what have you been doing? You know, I, uh, I've never been, I've never been a writer per se. Well, I did write a book. Thanks for the plug inside Timmy's mind. Uh, contact me for that. But uh, in terms of writing, in terms of writing comedy for performance, I'm kind of the guy who perceives what's happening around me. The next time I get on stage, I flush it out. Next time I get on stage, I tighten it up, go from there. I don't think I've ever really written a joke down. So um, I can't say that I've been doing much writing, but I've been creating, keeping the creative energy flowing. And I think that's what all of us should have been doing. I know some people who have just curled up into a ball, but that's why I started the Instagram live show. Like I, I, I never would have started it um, pre COVID. Cause I was always like, I don't have the proper lighting. I don't have the proper audio. I don't even know how to work Instagram, um, sure. but, but it forced me to, I mean, I have one thing that I want to do in life and that's make people laugh. So, so yeah. I kept the creative, create the creative juices going. I've actually found some new avenues along the way. Uh, a lot of yoga. That's why my shoulders look hot. And I'm just, I'm just in a good, I'm in a good position right now. Dude, for sure. And, uh, and I wanted to know too, but like, what was it that um, attracted you to comedy? Do you, do you remember that day? Like when you said, I want to make people laugh? Has it been something you've wanted to do since you were young? Yeah, I, whether or not I remember the, the exact day and whether people want to believe this or not, but um, I, uh, I kind of vaguely remember the moment that I made my sister last laugh for the very first time. And she would have been three, maybe I was five, I don't know, maybe in that range. And I just, from that point on, I just know that my life has been filled with just making people laugh. My mom called me, said I was most, the most annoying person she ever knew growing, like, <laughs> throughout my growing up. Because the stage, stage was my life, or life was staged, however you want to want to put that. Yeah. So making people laugh is, is the thing that jacks me up constantly it, it's i think it's 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 an amazing i we should have been listed as essential workers during covid quite frankly because this, this is the time when people needed laughter and it's the thing that excites me more than anything oh totally and speaking of making people laugh and in, in, in comedy like you know we're in this unprecedented time right this global mm -hmm. pandemic what do you see uh for the comedy scene uh i mean Will it rebound? Do you foresee that? Oh, absolutely. It's going to rebound. Um, I, I don't know. I think there's going to be a blend. I think shows like this are going to continue. I think people have become comfortable. I've done some Zoom shows. I think they're super cool. But I think what's going to happen is it's going to be kind of like uh, the medieval dark ages going into the Renaissance. I, I, don't, I didn't go to school um, very much, so I'm not sure if, that's, if I had gone to school, I probably wouldn't be you know, performing in front of seven people from my living room <laughs> once a week. But sure. um, the, uh, I think we're going to go into like, uh, like that Renaissance period again. I think the arts are going to like blow up. This will be considered a dark time. I think live theater was dying. Uh, comedy, comedy clubs were not doing as well. People were watching everything on DVD. But eventually, look, at the end of this thing, we're all going to watch have every Netflix special that's ever been produced, all of the comedy DVDs, and people are going to be like, I need to go see this stuff live again. And I think this comedy scene is, when it does, when it does open up fully again, it's going to explode. We just yeah. got to get through this time somehow. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you bring up a lot of great points. Um, you know, that laughter really is the best medicine, right? Especially, you know, in this time, for sure. Uh, you know, I'm interested to, like, with you growing up in Canada, who is, who is your comic idol? Um, well, I, growing up, I don't know if I had, I, Wayne and Schuster, I don't know if you, if you're familiar with Wayne and Schuster, legends up here in Canada. Mm. Um, and a lot of our, a lot of our good comics have gone down down into the states i keep saying that we're up above you but we might even be below you where i live compared to where you are sure but um my my actually my my um my idols if you would uh dean martin jack benny bob newhart uh guys from you know like a, a generation ago when i perform live i perform in a suit i drink out of my orange juice glass which by the way um, I drank out of the same orange juice while doing my Instagram show, 150 Days. Uh, it continued to, at one point it got fermented, then it just started to dissolve. I don't know what's in this glass right now. Oh but it, it used to be a refreshing drink, but we kind of turned it into a science experiment. Over yeah, the yeah, you got, you got something growing there, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, so I drink out of a glass, I wear a suit. I, I, I kind of old school in that fact that I sit on a stool and just tell stories. Um, but that generation just really excited me. And uh, being a clean comic back then, they had to be clean due to uh, you know TV censorship and stuff. I've just used it though, whether I'm in a club or a school or a church or you know out in a field somewhere, I, I'm always clean, but I, I like to have that classic look. But every once in a while, I could just do a, a front hand flip or a or be wearing a dress and a wig or, you know, doing yoga on stage. I don't know. I take it down some weird paths sometimes. Sure, sure, man. So I, I wanted to ask you too, because you, you've done a lot of great things. And I want to talk about, you know, Canada's clean comedy circuit, which is yeah. what you do. Uh, can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Why that's significant? Yeah, well, it was... Uh, when I, when I went into comedy, and that's a whole other story, I wasn't expecting, I went to film and television. I wanted to, I wanted to, I still want to go on to TV. Um, so, you know, when we get into a studio and you get your full NBC show or whatever, you know, have me back on. <laughs> no doubt. But that was, that's my love. Sitcoms is, in fact, Bob Newhart, who would be my idol, I didn't even know he did stand up. I'd watched a couple of his TV shows and I just liked his, his pacing and everything before I even knew he did stand up. So um, I fell into stand-up 12 years ago through Leland Clausen. I don't know if you're familiar with Leland. And we, uh, we were talking about the, the void in comedy and the fact that, especially clean comedy, you, if you see a clean show and you don't get to it, you don't know where it's going to show up again. It could, I mean, there's so few that are, at, that are at the top of the game in terms of that clean stuff. We're like, where is it going to be again? And so a lot of people don't want to go into the clubs um, because you're not, it's a hit and miss. You know, if you want clean comedy, maybe you're going to get a cleaner night one night, maybe not the next. So we realized that maybe we should, maybe there should be a system like a, a club system where people can know if they miss a show, they can, they can, they know when another one is coming. And so um, in 2011, I started the circuit, which is uh, Canada's first and only clean comedy club circuit. We currently tour. Uh, well, we don't now, but coming out of right into the COVID, we were doing 14 cities that host five shows a year, try wow. to stay in the same venue every time. So if somebody missed it, like clockwork, September, November, January, March, May, you know that if you missed it, another one's coming up. We have almost 200 people on our season ticket list. So they buy tickets ahead of the season to see all five shows that year. Uh, we bring up different headliners from all around North America. I host the show, sometimes I headline. And we also have about eight people that we mentor. So we believe in providing top-notch clean comedy on a regular basis, as well as raising in and investing into the younger generation um, as well. So we give them spots on our stage too. So uh, it's called The Circuit. I'm super proud of it. We are about to celebrate huge uh, season 10 and then uh, COVID uh, shut down the world right after we got off the road of uh, our, our second last tour of season nine. What a great accomplishment for you. I mean, nine seasons of the clean comedy circuit for you. Amazing. And uh, so did you So did you guys go to like all the big clubs in Canada then? A lot of my circuit is done um, in uh, churches, schools, lions clubs. Uh, we even have a library on our tour. Um, <laughs> nice. the, the schools and churches in particular, because of the style and the, or the, the, the clean brand, 
they're invested in it. They want something for their community and they need it to be clean. Yeah. So those seem to be great venues for us. We're not opposed to working in the clubs. I'm not even against the club work, but the, my, my journey took me down this niche road that uh, took me into a lot, of, uh, a lot of schools and churches. And so a lot of our venues are that. Although to be fair, there are people who, when they see it's in a church, they get, af they get afraid. They're thinking, oh, it's gonna be you know, church comedy. <laughs> and uh, really it's just, we're, we, don't, we don't do anything like that. We just, we just put high, high quality, clean comedy and they just happen to uh, want to offer that to their communities. And some of them have some really nice performance rooms. That's awesome, man. Um, not only adults can come, but kids too, right? Because it's clean comedy. So it's a family show. And I think that is amazing. I mean, all the whole family can come and enjoy it, have some good mm -hmm. laughs. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing about season 10 with you and, uh, you know, the clean comedy circuit. That's awesome, man. Yeah, man. Well, we'd love to get you up across the border. We actually uh, have a show, a regular show in Sarnia and in Windsor, which uh, both of them are right across the border from you guys. But I like to think that I can take my comedy, whether it be in your living room. I performed in front of four people in a living room. One girl didn't even laugh, so technically it was only three people. But, you know, like sometimes people say, well, we don't have a full room. And that's what COVID's doing right now, right? They're like, oh, well, we can't fill our auditorium. I, I don't need that. I, 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 a thousand seater, a festival uh, outside thing, four people in a living room. I just want to provide an opportunity for people to laugh regardless of age, race, gender, religious belief. And uh, the, the brand of comedy that I do, hey, because it's clean doesn't mean it's better than, than not clean. I appreciate comedy across the board, but there certainly is a, a, a need out there for an opportunity for the grandmother and the granddaughter to sit in the same room and enjoy some stand up comedy. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And talking about, you know, that clean comedy circuit, uh, what, so what are the goals for you then kind of moving forward? What's the ultimate dream? What's the ultimate goal? Uh, well, with that circuit in particular, uh, the ultimate goal is to establish 14 cities here in Ontario um, that uh, span all the way right across the province, running, uh, running about 70 family-friendly, um, high, high standard, clean comedy shows a year. That being said, um, it is a scalable product and, and uh, Upstanding Comedy has, we, we sell just as many tickets now for shows where the headliner is not even announced, which tells me that my brand uh, is being um, respected enough and known enough that people say, look, we just, we just know whoever he brings in is going to be good. So it's scalable in the fact that I'd love to, you know, bring the tour outside of Ontario. I'd love to bring the tour down into the States. Um, so uh, I guess my overall picture is how do I flood, um, you know, North America and maybe the world. I don't know. I'm trying to put up a, an Australian tour. Um, and just provide an opportunity for as many people to laugh at, as I can. So that would be the ultimate vision. Right now, I'm, uh, you know, I'm just willing to take whatever, whatever comes my way. There are two of my favorite uh, Canadian comedians, Dan Aykroyd and uh, mm -hmm. Jim Carrey, two of the two great ones. We have a, we have a rich history. I, I, my background, my dad's Irish, uh, my mom's American, but I get a very dry and, and witty thing from, you know, like, John Cleese and Monty Python and a lot of that British humor came in yeah. from my dad through me. Um, so uh, it's, it's amazing. We, the Canada is so well rooted uh, in comedy that it's, it's nice to be a part of it. But the reality is, is that I want to get myself down to south, south of the border as much as I can too. Lastly, uh, if anybody yeah. wants to keep up with you um, on Instagram, on your website, find out more about the tour, how can they yeah. do that? Uh, upstandingcomedy.ca. So upstandingcomedy.ca. You can go to timmyboyle.ca, timmyboyle.com. Um, and then through social media, uh, Instagram and Facebook is the real Timmy Boyle, Timmy Bits on Twitter. If you go to upstandingcomedy.ca, you'll find everything. But, uh, but definitely uh, go, go to uh, Timmy's Shorts on YouTube. Subscribe there because that's where 100 episodes of me having conversations with comedians from all around the world are going to be is going to be up there uh, probably in the next week or so. So Timmy Shorts on YouTube is a great way to start as well. Awesome. Really quick, what is the weirdest thing you've eaten other than that orange juice during quarantine? I was, I was going to say I did take a sip out of this, and in one episode <laughs> you, you literally see me spit it off to the side. It, it, yeah. got, it got super bad. Okay. So the, the weirdest thing I've eaten is that what you're saying? Is that yeah. what you just said? Yeah. Yeah. In yep. COVID. 
Um, well, I haven't eaten very much uh, because <laughs> when I did the show, I was putting the episode numbers on toilet paper. Well, toilet paper was pretty scarce. Yeah. So if, if you don't eat and drink, you don't need to need the toilet paper. So right. that way I was able to use the toilet paper for my episode numbers. Okay. So, so I pretty much starved myself uh, over the last, uh, last six months, but uh, that became a really cool recognizable piece. So it's probably worth it. There we go. Well, I, I would have to say with that one, you're on a roll. So, <laughs> hey, so thanks so much, Timmy Boyle. Uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff. Appreciate it. Guys, definitely check him out. Check out his website. And thank you so much, Timmy. Guys, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Cheers. Thanks, Zach. Hello, everyone, and welcome Dan Arbor tonight. And welcome back to Ann Arbor tonight. I am so excited to introduce our musical guest for the evening. She's born and raised in Michigan. She's performed at the Jazz Festival in Michigan. And she's received a Kindness Award. She is huge and doing great things in the music business. Please give a warm Ann Arbor tonight welcome for Canon Elizabeth. Thank you, Zach. Um, thank you for having me tonight. It's wonderful to be here. So my first song is going to be Little League. Lately I've been feeling strange Everybody 
this next song is called Set the Sea. Remember the third of December, me and your 
everyone and welcome to Ann Arbor tonight. everyone welcome back to ann arbor tonight at home canon elizabeth everybody my goodness what a wonderful wonderful job canon thank you so much for being with us uh so first of all i am so just excited to have you and i wanted to talk really quickly about just how you started because uh you have a pretty interesting journey and so i wanted to know you know what was it for you that first got you interested in music yeah, so I don't really, that's a good question to ask. I don't really know just because there's nobody in my family that's musically inclined. <laughs> Is that right? I definitely didn't get it from my parents. So, sure. Um, I don't really know where it started, but I do certainly have a journey. I mean, everybody does. Um, I started performing when I was 13 to get paid and do three hour gigs. So that was a big thing for me. And now I'm here. Um, so that <laughs> obviously got me somewhere. Um, I'm looking to do some festivals next year. I've done a few already, but um, I don't know if I will be able to just with everything that's going on in the world. So, yeah. Yeah, can you, can you, so first of all, you've done Common Ground, you've done Jazz Fest. What is like the top festival for you? Um, probably Common Ground. That was a big one for me. Yeah. Nice. And then, so yeah, and then you talk about, of course, our current situation um, and everything, which by the way, I really wish we could have had you in studio and hopefully we can at some point. But, you know, we're making do with the situation and that we have and, you know, you're pressing on and doing what you need to do as an artist. Do you find yourself now with this particular situation, especially with the other artists that are doing sort of the similar things? I mean, do you have more time to really write and do the artistic things that you necessarily didn't have uh, for beforehand? I do have more time to write, but I would still say that I think 2020 has been a pretty busy year for performances, actually, and a lot of them did get canceled, but then we also had a lot that asked us to come play out on patios and stuff, so it's out in open air, which was a big thing um, this summer on patios, and I ended up doing some uh, free neighborhood concerts for my community just to get everybody out and about, you know, um, everybody's kind of stuck at home so I think that being doing all that kept me busy but then I did have some time to write absolutely and Canon you are a true 
beacon of light in the arts for sure. And I think that speaks a lot to you um, that you were able to use that to bring your community together. So that's amazing. And uh, one of the other things too, and I find this very interesting when I talk to different musicians, but what were some of the early sort of like, you know, musical inspirations for you and the different artists that you admired? So there's a, a band, I don't know if you know of them or not, but they're called The Revivalists. And I definitely grew up with my parents listening to them. So I now listen to them as well. Um, I really like Johnny Cash as well um, and Billie Eilish, just her being so young. Um, but yeah. I got to meet David Shaw last year, I think it was, and I got to play a song for him. So that was pretty cool. Oh my gosh, were you nervous? Yeah, I was. <laughs> I didn't say I didn't talk to you, but I definitely was. Did he give you any feedback? Um, no, he didn't give me any feedback, but it was just pretty cool in general that I did get to play with him. He actually mentioned me on stage that night when he was on stage. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, and, and Johnny Cash, I mean, you know, the man in black, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. just such a foundational sound. Uh, you know, in the music world. And I, I, I agree, Johnny Cash is one of my favorites, one of the best storytellers uh, as far as musicians go to. I also, I also do like um, the Lumineers and the Head and the Heart. I was supposed to see the Head and the Heart in concert and meet them, but COVID happened. So um, that kind of ruined it. <laughs> no, I mean, hey, you know, uh, what are some of the big goals that you have uh, sort of for the rest of this year uh, and kind of moving forward? I just want to be able to write more music and get better as a musician. I think that's one of the big important things is having your own material, especially if I want to be playing at festivals next year. Um, I think that's pretty much my main goal is just to get better as a musician. And yeah, we already have 16 shows booked for 2021 so wow that's awesome and and you also it's crazy because you're also a student at the same time so you know as a as a performer can you talk about you know the balance right between doing shows and touring and going to festivals but then also you know balancing the academics um you know is that a challenge for you or or not really um, well, I'm 14. I'm a freshman. Um, so it can be a little challenging at times. I just took driver's training, so a lot going on. But um, I still do find out, find some time to um, work on my music. Um, I try to do as, as much as I can in my free time when I'm not, you know, on Zoom classes or, you know, in school but it's it's funny because all the kids in my grade they play sports and that takes up all of their time outside of school so this is my sport even though it's not really a sport but it takes takes about the same amount of time that a sport does <laughs> i couldn't agree more and the same amount of energy um you know mm -hmm. as a fellow performer canon you know, there was a quote that was told to me years ago, and it said, you know, performers were athletes of the heart, right? Yeah. <laughs> so absolutely, I can definitely relate and agree there. And of course, uh, very exciting things. You have a single coming out uh, later in the month. Thank you. So can you talk about that? Um, so my next single is called What's Next? Um, we're playing around with the name a little bit, so I always get it confused. Um, I think that's the one that we're going with, though. What's next? Um, I'm pretty excited for the music video, so that's gonna be that's gonna be something fun just to have during these um, quarantine times, I guess. You could say. <laughs> Absolutely, no, for sure. Lastly, too, you've done so much. Uh, you know, you've played at festivals. You won a kindness award which is amazing and also again you're working on this single 
So, uh, you know, talk about how people can keep up with Canon Elizabeth, how they can find you um, and follow you and also enjoy your music. So I have a website, which is linked in my Instagram, which is at Canon Elizabeth, um, K-A-N-I-N. Um, I have a Facebook account. Uh, I think that's Canon Elizabeth as well. So that's where people can kind of find me and keep up with all my shows for 2021 and the remaining of 2020. Um, yeah, that's where you can find me. So once again, at Canon Elizabeth is my Instagram. If you could perform with one superstar right now, who would that be and why? That's, that's a hard one. Um, I think possibly Brandy Carlisle would be would be a cool one to perform with, but there's just so many others that come to mind. Um, I, when I did perform at Common Ground, she was there the night before I performed there. So we went to go watch her and it was just, it was cool seeing her up there on stage and just listening to all her music. And she's an amazing songwriter. So I think it'd be, be a lot of fun to perform with her. Absolutely. And Brandy, I hope you can, uh, you know, keep Cannon on your radar and uh, check her out as she continues the climb. Absolutely. We are going to take a quick break, folks, and we'll be right back. But thank you so much, Cannon and Elizabeth. Continue uh, to do great things. We appreciate you so much. And thank you so much for joining us on Ann Arbor tonight at home. <laughs> 